who he was. They don't know anything about him. Nobody knew who George W. Bush was. So they were all anonymous and could get away with it. So during that meeting, uh, we surmised that probably uh, G. Gorn Liddy had someone come in and put maybe some LSD in, LSD in my father's drink and also uh, had put the LSD mixture on my father's steering wheel, uh, which was out in the uh, parking lot, and I'm sure they knew what, what car and, it was. And that's what they did to Jack Anderson. You know, they Jack put, Anderson. Yeah, they put LSD on the steering wheel. It was immediately absorbed into the skin. But there's there's evidence there's that, that there might be another drug that was used. But go ahead. That's correct. Uh, it was a mixture of something, uh, drugs. So uh, if my father finished his drink, and uh, was about to leave uh, the uh, meeting there. He was going home. Uh, we had some race horses back then, and one of our race horses was running in Louisiana. <coughs> and my father wanted to go home and call our uh, call our trainer and see what the uh, outcome of the uh, horse race was. So that's why he really left the meeting. So he left the meeting and uh, left the parking lot. Uh, got in his car, put his hands on the steering wheel, and headed down an access road leading from the motel uh, to, to where we lived at that time. And within uh, 45 to 60 seconds, uh, this LSD mixture would uh, go into your skin and get into your brain within 60, 60 minutes, 60 seconds or something like that. So from the uh, diplomat in down to the turnoff where my father would have to turn, uh, was at a corner uh, where there was a, uh, uh, a, a hospital there, but the access road went on down in front of the hospital and came to a dead end. Uh, there was a big mound of dirt there at the end of that road and <clears throat> to uh, supposedly keep people from going off into that 20-foot, uh, uh, it was a drainage ditch, a 20-foot culvert, uh, cement culvert drainage ditch at the end of that road. Well, when my, by the time my father had gotten to uh, that particular intersection, the LSD had begun to work on him, and he says the last that he remembers was uh, he blacked out. He didn't know why, but he blacked out, and he slumped forward. That was his last uh, memory as he crossed the intersection and went on down the road to the towards the uh, cement cover, which is probably another maybe uh, 100 yards away. Uh, so it was very easy uh, for him to uh, just keep on going down that access road and as uh, he remembers his foot hitting the gas pedal and slumping over the steering wheel. And so the police said he was probably going maybe at 90 to 100 miles an hour by the time he got to this big mound of dirt. And uh, he just slammed into the mound of dirt and threw him up in the air. And by the time his brand new Lincoln Mark III uh, dived into that cement culvert, it just crushed it like a beer can. And uh, my father wound up in the floor. He didn't have his seatbelt on. So it knocked him into the floor, and that's really what saved his life. And uh, they pulled the car, my father, uh, out of the uh, out of the cement culvert there, and rushed him to the hospital. And his uh, doctors uh, immediately came there and operated on him, and uh, was able to save his life uh, that night. I remember my father's uh, administrative assistant calling me about three or four o'clock in the morning and saying, uh, "Warren, you need to come to the hospital. Your father's been in an automobile accident." And of course, at that time, they did not know that it might be, you know, an LSD uh, type of uh, situation. So my, uh, the doctors, uh, the only thing they did was a, a blood alcohol test on him. And his uh, blood alcohol uh, level was so low uh, that they didn't even report it in the uh, paper the next day. They just said that Seymour Town had, a, had an automobile accident and uh, that, uh, you know, he had been at the uh, diplomat at a political meeting and that was just a way of sort of uh, in a subliminal message to say that he was probably drinking he was probably drunk and that's probably why at the accident that he was drunk but he was not of course but uh, that's what the uh, newspaper story uh, indicated in, in the next day okay uh, Warren I just want to put you on hold for a sec because we're okay. now moving into the I am nature extended part of the uh, show here Okay. Folks, if you want to call in and get in on this discussion, it's uh, B Porter five six one one on Skype. Uh, the phone number is not working right now, so B Porter five six one one. Now I do have someone who uh, I, I mentioned yesterday who wants to join in the conversation. She's a previous guest. Her name is Pamela Jones. And oh, let's great. just see if I can get her in on the conversation. Very here. good. Yes, that's terrific. Yeah, we want to talk to her. Yeah. 
yeah, I'm just tr uh, hooking up with her now. I think she was there, so hopefully she's uh, going to connect with us. And yeah, because she's a great activist, uh, weaponizednews.com. <clears throat> and uh, oh, I think she's with us now. Pamela, are you with us? Yes, hello. Hi, Pamela. Hi, how are you guys doing this evening? Doing great, right, Pamela. Wonderful. You come, you come highly recommended. We're glad oh. you can join us, Pamela. I really wanted you to, to meet uh, Lisa and Warren. Uh, and Lisa is right in your, uh, well, I'm not sure how far apart you guys are, but you're, you're certainly in the same state. Yeah, where are you at? I'm in San Diego County. We're, yeah, we're pretty, pretty much hundreds of miles apart. Oh, San Diego County. I was, uh, it, now it's a magical place or something, right? Well, I'm in the last mountain range of California, so I'm, I'm above like the fray, you know, I, I just like oh. to say it that way. Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't know why. I just assumed you'd probably be Northern California, but. Well, I used to be, I, I lived in the Bay area for years and you're in Fremont, right? Or no, oh. not Fremont. Fresno. Fresno. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a real it's, pleasure. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm glad that we're, I, I, I do know who you are and, um, and Brian said, you guys have to connect. And so here we are. Well, wonderful. I'm so excited to hear what it is going on. How are you tonight, Brian? Oh, I'm, I'm so happy. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, officially a part of the Liberty Beacon movement now. And uh, you yeah. Are? Yeah, you I are? got invited to join today. Yay. Live on air. Congratulations. Yeah. Live on air. And uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, oh man, it's so exciting to see what they're doing and uh, yeah, and I'm having a great time with uh, with Warren and Lisa, and I'm really glad you could join us because you're you're another one of these great activists that you know you're connected with the Liberty Beacon movement too, and uh, you're doing some awesome work in Fresno. You got that. Uh, you, well, tell tell the tell the folks what you're doing. You got this uh, TV program going. You got the weaponized news thing going. Just give people a little summary of what you're up to. Well, I'm a local publisher, weekly classified paper and I partnered up with another well a couple of activists here in town uh, Sam Cheney was doing a TV show every day for an hour on access TV and we have since uh, been joined by Stuart Webb he came on a couple years ago and they do um, a two-hour radio show on K the local KGEP uh, 1680 AM it's conservative talk station here and that's two hours every Saturday from 6 to 8 p.m. Pacific. And then uh, we record that and run that on local access TV every night at uh, 6 o'clock. So. That's awesome. I, I sent you a friend request um, oh. via uh, Skype. Okay. I'll take so. it. I'm, I'm a newbie at this, so. Well, I, I used to do Skype for years, and I forgot how, and so... Brian had to like literally like walk me through it again. <laughs> pretty embarrassing for me because I, I'm pretty tech savvy, but I just uh, yeah I just haven't used it. Actually no yeah you you did you did great you did great yeah. I mean we got yeah. you going and uh, now it's like I say I love it because it's the best I find it's the best way to connect with people and uh, it's pretty dependable I mean it has its in and outs and it can it can drop and whatnot but you know it I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I love it. That's good. There, there, there's so many alternatives, you, you know, um, to it, so that that aren't as monitored. Um, and I think that that's just I just kind of took a kind of took a different road in preference. But you're right. Yeah, it's a great way to connect because here we are. Well, I mean, my attitude towards monitoring is that maybe it'll smarten up. If they start listening to some people making sense. <laughs> you're right. Yeah, they should. Yeah, no, because I, my message is everybody can win. Nobody has to lose. In my world, everybody can win. Yeah. Well, I'm willing to offer them all jobs, or a couple of them. Come to the light. Leave the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> my, but, son, my son teases me. He says, I know, Mom. If everybody did things the way you think that they should, the world would be perfect. And I said, that's exactly right. Yes. That's all it takes. Just just do it this way and we'll, we'll all be fine. Yeah, well, that starts with love, you know? It surely does. And uh, Beautiful. I've been 
practicing a little experiment now. Um, that much I might have told you, Brian. I've been doing it for several years now. Um, I hug everybody I meet as soon as I meet them. First thing I do is hug them with a big smile. Tell them how happy I'm seeing them. And no matter how the visit goes, good, bad, or indifferent, I always hug them uh, before I let them leave. Because how can you be mad at anybody after that? You just can't. You should. You should. Yeah. Tell them, tell them the story about, remember you went to the air quality control meeting and, and one of the board members, how they reacted to you and your uh, insistence that they look at the issue of geoengineering. That's a beautiful story. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I like to go down to the San Joaquin Valley Air Board and speak mm -hmm. to them. And they always laugh at me, mock at me, ignore me. Um, and I always put them in check, but they have a uh, citizen's board and so I hadn't never talked to them. I thought, well, I'll, maybe, the, maybe the citizens board will listen to me, you know, because the board of supervisors or the air board there doesn't. And there was a couple men up there. I think it was three and one woman. And I'm thinking maybe early 30s-ish. And so I, I'm by myself and I do my little spiel and I get all done and I thank them for their time and I leave I leave the room and I'm walking down the hallway and the lady who was up on that board on that, that big fancy, you know, half moon desk raised up on the platform, also professional. Uh, she actually got up Lisa and left the meeting, got off of the podium thingy there and chased me out of that room, chased me down the hall. And she says, I think something's going on. I'm worried too. And she told me she had a little girl. And she said that she's worried for her daughter. And um, uh, long story short, she offered to work with me. And I told her, well, you have all the power. I'm here to see if I can work with you. And we got all teary-eyed. And we ended that with a hug. And uh, so, yeah, I actually got somebody to leave the boardroom and chase me and hug me. So hugs are pretty powerful. It, it, it is, and, and if you out of a hundred people or a thousand or a hundred thousand, if you reach one person, you're still reaching, you know, one person. It's yeah. it's important. That's that's what we're supposed to do. I mean, whatever, like what Brian's doing and Paula, what you're doing is just to keep reaching out. I mean, I, I believe that that's why we're here, is to make that contact and to keep extending um, our hearts to others. Yeah, it's almost like be, becoming an alien species. Oh, we already are, honey. Yeah, well, like, you know, like, like, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, yeah. like, it's like, wow, there's others like me. Oh, wow, you know? And, and I seem to be able to identify uh, who I should have around me and who I shouldn't based on those hugs as well. Pretty powerful. Beautiful. Well, Pam, actually, we come into the world full of love. And uh, we we, uh, we train it out of our children. We condition them out of it. And it's a, a huge mistake. Uh, uh, one of the great uh, things we chatted about uh, uh, the day before with Lisa was the fact that she's a Montessori teacher. And I think it's a beautiful philosophy of education. And if all of our kids were, were taught the way the Montessori system works, I mean, we, would, we wouldn't, none of this stuff would be around. I mean, we wouldn't allow the planet to be destroyed. And we wouldn't allow for a military industrial complex. It's a beautiful system. About, maybe you could talk a bit about that, Lisa, how the money story system works. Well, okay, a lot of people have a kind of a global misconception, or here, I should say, in the United States, as Montessori being a very strict, regimented um, academic system. And I, I get it. You know, I can see that because everybody, I mean, every child, whether they're two and a half or, you know, 18, they have to roll up their rugs and put their work away and be responsible and wash their own dishes and wash their hands and just do things that, I mean, hopefully the rest of the world just kind of takes for granted. But um, but we also introduced in my Montessori school schools, Piaget and Waldorf, you know, always having um, natural materials, you know, in their hands. But primar primarily is that it's hands-on learning. Um, you don't put a kid at a desk to open a book on page 123 that has to be, you know, that the teachers have to be like, okay, on February 23rd, 
we have to be on page 123. It's not like that at all. It's all hands-on curriculum and it, and it reinforces play and environment, environmental responsibility. Um, it's just, it's how kids really learn, you know, it, to, to instill a love of learning in children because the way that the public school systems do it robs them of that. I mean, it robbed me of that for sure. You know, um, and I just, it, it's just, it's, it's pretty dismal, you know, how we, how we uh, actually educate our kids to where they end up hating going to school, you know, uh, and we don't instill that love of learning. But if we create an environment that nurtures being outside, climbing trees, growing gardens, um, it, it just, it's a totally different effect. And I, and I think that the public school system is basically a feeder program to the military industrial complex and to the prison system. That's how it's designed. And that, that is statistically proven. Who wants to sit at a desk all day? Do you guys? No, I mean, I, do, I don't. <laughs> I say that all the time, man. If you hate your job, you better stop today and do something else. You know, what you just described was my education as a child. I'm 58. Yeah, I'm now. Uh, you just described my education as a child more so than what's going on today, and that's a huge disconnect. And, and unfortunately, the parents don't even recognize it. That's one of the reasons I speak up is because I see things that younger people don't see. You know? Yeah, we're well. Our, I mean, you know, it's basically a daycare system. You know, parents that don't have the time, don't have the energy, or don't have the interest, and in, and in just letting their kids either be homeschooled or, you know, or teaching them and just taking like, I mean, Brian's son is a really good example, you know, because he's, he's really into, you know, um, skiing and, and being at the top of his league in it. I mean, he's, his son is literally outdoors, enjoying himself, doing something he's interested in. You Self-motivated. I'll tell you, this kid is all on his own. I mean, he learns, he's on the internet. <clears throat> he understands everything. I haven't taught him a thing. This guy just knows. He's learned yes, but, uh, it. He's okay, absorbed right. it. But you've encouraged it. I mean, oh, yes, yes. But I'm yeah, saying that you're saying once that. you find your purpose or your, your gift in life, it pushes you to learn. And you, you build on that. And that's what the Montessori system does with kids. It lets well, them find their niche, their, their path. Yes, but you've nurtured that. I mean, your son wouldn't have it if you didn't oh definitely i let him his... i let him do crazy things is that like most parents wouldn't let him do what i let him do on skis when he was young yes okay. i said okay if you get hurt fine but i mean i'm warning you now what you're doing is crazy and he said no watch i'll do it <laughs> uh, <laughs> and i didn't stop him i mean most parents would have said don't go near the you know the watering guns uh, don't go in there don't go in that groove don't go in the trees don't i he just used to fly out of ski run like four years old doing crazy stuff I said, well, okay, as long as you don't get hurt, I guess you can do it. And he never got hurt, so I never stopped him. Well, and you can't stop him even if he does get hurt. I mean, because it's his passion. You, you know, it's he, you've nurtured this passion in him. Whether he gets hurt or doesn't, he'll still do it. <laughs> well, luckily he had enough skill not to get hurt, you know. <laughs> well, sometimes you can't help it. I mean, the, <clears throat> sometimes you're just going to get hurt. It's yeah, fine. no, no, like, no, like, yeah. For sure, like for it, sure. Like but the bubble wrap life. generation is killing our kids. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Well, you know, they're not educating them by no means. They're just indoctrinating them. Sit down. Shut up. Turn to page 12. Stand yeah. up. Get in line. Sit down. Eat your lunch. Be yeah. quiet. And what does that do to your critical thinking abilities? And the okay. only, only thing that matters is obeying rules. What does that do to your critical thinking? <laughs> they rape them of their critical thinking. They rape them of their creativity. They rape them of any knowledge base whatsoever. You know, and that's what they're there for. That's what exactly. they they are accomplishing what they intended to do. Have you guys heard about? I don't know. I've heard it here. Um, I don't know what they're doing, but I think it's in California. They want to combine the sheriff's bu uh, buses that hauls prisoners. They won't want the front half to be prisoners, so it'd be painted black and white, and the back half to be to haul students, and it'll be painted no, no. like no. a bus. I've seen pictures of this, and no, that no. is just 
preparing those kids to go in, you either go into the industrial complex or go into prison. Those are the only two choices and both of them are at the chokehold of the government. So is that just up in your neck of the woods? What's uh, what you... I caught wind of that a while back, a couple years ago. I'd have to look into it again. And then here in Fresno, because I do live in a Target market, they test everything here. Yeah. I see a half taxi cab, half police car rolling around the street. Yeah. Say, can you say that again, please? I must it have was missed that. A half police car, it was black and white. And mm -hmm. the other half was yellow for a taxi cab. So it was half taxi cab, half police car. Is that to like uh, save on money? I mean, what? I don't know. Maybe if they're not hauling, you know, someone's butt to jail, then they can take a taxi ride. I'm not really sure. Um, I never really looked into it, but I did see that, it. That sounds, that, that sounds pretty horrifying. <laughs> well, maybe so. they can't afford to pay their police. They're saying, well, if you're not picking someone up for a felony you can uh, make some money driving somebody else around i mean honest to god I mean, uh, no, all I the think, all the tax money's been stolen well i think the half taxi half police car will work good here because our police department literally runs the drugs on the streets the deputy D, uh deputy chief is that what they call him? Yeah, the deputy chief was just arrest, or uh, yeah, he was arrested by the FBI for running heroin and pills and marijuana and stuff on the streets. So he could have just given himself, he could have locked himself up and then given himself a ride home when he got out. But yeah. So. Well, I'm telling you, you're absolutely right. And this has been, I just looked it up. It's been going on until uh, at least, at least until uh, September 15th, 2006, where, um, prison inmates are uh, transported in um, through high school and school age children's vehicles or school buses um, to save on costs. And then there was something when I ran across all that um, and that was yeah so several years ago. Are you saying the kids are on the bus at the same yes, time? Yes. Yeah, it's right. Yeah. I thought you were saying like they took the kids to school and then they used the same bus to, to move no, the prisoners. It's the, they're on the bus. From what I just read, they're on the bus at the same time. So all the pedophiles are hanging out with the kids. So isn't that wonderful? Yeah, yes. And the bus is painted half as black and white sheriff and the back half, I think it was, was yellow. But in, but in that research, when I ran across all that, they also were saying something about um, getting rid of some of the public schools and just taking those kids to the prison facility, that the guards were more capable of teaching the children how to learn because the schools here are all failing. And the, well, and, yeah, yeah, and learning how to be in a prison. That's what that they're That was like a them. precursor. Yeah five or six yes. years ago to say, hey, we're going to start taking your kids to school over at the prison to save money. And that'll come. Watch. Mark my words. It will. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, I mean, I'm glad you're telling me this. I, I It's despicable, but it, but I'm reading, I'm reading about it right now and all over, all over the United States. Wow. Yeah. That's scary. It is that not scary? They're just trading yeah. our military industrial complex. Are there any parents aware of this, Pamela, other than you? Are there any parents uh, fighting about it or writing notes to the school board or, like, going not down there that, and complaining? Not that I know of. You know, I think I'm not yeah. one that screams about anything like this, quite honestly, Brian. No, yeah, no, I'm not I'm not seeing any kind of um, outrage or I, – I Googled it, you know, I mean, and – it just seems to be commonplace in some. Holy in cow! Some this is I, I know in Canada you wouldn't get away with doing something that outrageous. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, the parents here are very protective. Like I said, bubble wrap, so they wouldn't allow uh, kids to go on the same bus as prisoners. I mean, uh, well, it, uh, it's the geoengineering. I think in the, uh, the the more fluoride down there, the people are just lost it. The parents. California. They're not even is, conscious anymore. I mean, that's outrageous. California is like a planet all its own. Like we live in the solar system somewhere 50 million light years away. Everybody here is very unique. They're very, 
think they just don't think in California nobody has any critical thinking skills I, well there's they, they they think that they're so liberal so anything goes like anything goes like oh okay yeah we're gonna be helping the prisoners you know uh, communicate with our school children and that's gonna be a good life experience I mean it's just it's it, yeah california is is way off the edge of everything yeah I, I you know one part of me wants to really leave because i expect them to one day lock the state down and those of us left here aren't going to even be able to get out it feels so much like a prison open air prison camp to me okay uh, paula i want to tell you something that's really important and maybe i should do this in a private message um but there are ways around that so i will give that to you in a private message. Brian, okay. give me give me her her contact information. Uh, it's not anything I want to talk about, you know. Here. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. I, you know, okay. whatever you feel comfortable talking to, uh, you know, this is public. So yeah, it's no. Not, Certain things yeah, are better in private. I think I dropped it uh yesterday uh to you, but I can do it again. Well, you gave me you gave me Paul's website. Um but her uh, Skype just, her Skype address I gave you. No, we don't want to use Skype address because that's wide open for anybody. To oh, see. okay. Well, uh, uh, Pamela, do you remember how to get into the chat just, box? There's a chat box you can get into. Just throw your phone number in there if you want. Uh, where is it at? You got to click on the bubble on the on the bottom right of the conversation. You'll get a bubble, and then you should get a place where you can type in. Look yeah. at him no. training me too. <laughs> Paula, don't do that. Don't do that, Paula. Don't do okay. it. Okay, just I'll I'll figure it out and I'll find you. No, oh, if you don't want to make it at all public, then yeah, I yeah. Yeah, don't do it. I, I yeah, don't. I mean, not for this, not for what I want to share with you. Yeah. All right. Okay, yeah, just we'll figure it out. Yeah. Or you can find her email or whatever. I can I can give you her phone number. Whatever system you think is most private, I mean, we can use it. Yeah. There is an offer, one, but I but I have I have some resources to do that. Well, exactly. But, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I could say okay, it's all, we'll, everything's uh, being, uh, pigeons. We're all going to have to get carrier pigeons. <laughs> well, I mean, it, they worked. They worked. Uh, they, they did. did. Yeah. They did. They worked for the okay. Rothschild. I'm getting ready to go through a, um, um, ham radio class. Oh, good. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah. That's great. That starts here in a, oh, do I don't you? know. Do. Paula, do you know about uh, the CERT training, a community emergency response training? It's free, and it's yes. offered everywhere. You know, uh, and it's a really good resource, and it it gives you the get out of jail free card that I was referring to. Oh, yeah. The uh, ham radio classes is being held to look at the uh, Clovis Police Department too. So, CERT. Well, one of the reasons I wanted you two to meet is that I, I know Pamela was saying she wanted to get out of California, but from what Lisa's been telling me is that the air quality is not bad where she is, and it's south of you. So I thought you might want to consider, instead of leaving California, going south to where she's, she's hanging out. Yeah, tell me. Okay, yeah, it's the last mountain range in California, but yeah, no, we, we've all, my family and I all have plans on, on getting out as well because there's a lot of resources um where i live water game you know um and we're right we're just 70 miles inland of the coast of san diego county so um it's all going to be done when it's done um mm -hmm. so we all have a like a get out you know get, a getaway plan everybody should no matter what but yeah it's it's lovely here and i was telling brian i'd love to have you come for a visit i'd be happy to be your host you can come and stay. Yeah, that would be wonderful because I'm I, breath was killing me today. They hit us with. I uh, there must have been ten planes in the sky every which direction, every height, and they were at all kinds of different altitudes, and I I struggled all day long today. It was it's bad here. It's I can't even tell you guys how bad the air is here. I've been in put up some pictures later so and it's really taken a toll on me and that's another reason remember Brian I told you that I speak up is because these young kids need to know and they need to stop being exposed to all these chemicals so they're not struggling when they're my age there's no 
no reason I should be having all these health issues that I've had here the last six, seven years. So, so yeah, I might take you up on that. I need a trip. Oh, oh. In. Yeah, please, yeah, please do. I'd be, I'd be happy to, to, to put you up and, and it's, a, it really is a beautiful little mountain town. And I'm just, I mean, Emily, like an hour, not even an hour away from the border um, of Tecate, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you can just kind of, you know, disappear, you know, out there, but I'm not saying that this is the, the end all be all it isn't, but it's, it's a good place, um, to kind of view what's going on. I'm not that far from the Salton sea, but all sorts of weird stuff's going on there too. Yeah. I follow that. Yeah. Yeah. Shaking and moving and I've seen steam and I've seen a lot of things on that. Well, the Navy um, has always owned, you know, the Salton Sea and oh. uh, for uh, nuclear, as a nuclear uh, testing site, among other things. Um, and now also they're going to deplete the Salton Sea because there's so much uh, thermal activity, earthquakes and everything. There's like hot pockets under the ground right. that they're, they're draining the Salton Sea um, to pull out this thermal energy, but what's happening in, in, as a result of draining the Salton Sea is there's all these plutonium isotopes that are getting into the air. Oh, um, no. In a heavily agricultural area, that's the Imperial Valley. It's like where California right. grows everything. Yeah, and yeah, kids I are affected the most. Um, but all that stuff as they drain it um, is you know, producing all these terrible toxins in the air um and i was telling i, I think i told brian that there's a, a, a there's a, a nuclear um submarine station underneath the sea of cortez which is what the salton sea ultimately you know drained out into mm -hmm. yeah it's highly toxic it's so you got the salton sea giving you a bunch of toxins and then just north of you You've got that, um, what's it called, uh, uh, Harris Ranch or something, where all the um, gas is leaking? Um, yeah, that's north. That's north and west of where we are. But but more importantly is the, the Chocolate Mountain Guttery Range, which is just on the other side of the Salton Sea. Did you guys ever see the movie Top Gun with Tom yeah. Cruise? Yeah. Okay, that's, yeah. That's where it was filmed. So right where I live, the desert right below from the mountains where I live, that's where all of that um, was filmed. And so there's a, a guttery range. It's a secret hidden, but there's landmines all around the chocolate mountains. So you can't like climb on it. Highly unadvisable. Um, uh, where they, they've got a, a base. There's a base up there and like, like, like this culvert of this mountain. It's just amazing um, in a sinister way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's just right. Yeah, they do. They're doing all sorts of things there. And I was telling Brian about the, the missile tests that, that happened three days a week from the San Clemente islands out to the, to the Salton sea. And if the missiles go so fast, you can't see them, but all you can see is their trail. That's just left there in, in the sky. It's just the big scar across the blue sky. I feel like we live in a big science laboratory. We do. Where does it end? And what are these people thinking? I mean, just the disaster, the environmental disasters going on that we just talked about, the Salton Sea, the gas leaks there in LA. I mean, there, there's hundreds of them, Fukushima. I mean, they are literally killing our planet so rapidly. I see it. You, you guys see it, don't you? Yeah, we, we do. Oh, and definitely. It's like my, a my, science lab. It's like they they're not they something. I don't know how we stop them, but it, they've got we, we, to stop we, with their. We can't. We we're not going to stop them because it ha it's happened. It's been decades in the making through the Club of Rome and the, the Tavistock Institute. But um, we 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 really are a science lab, and that's why in 1992. Uh, November 12, 1992, Bill Clinton uh, put into act the omnibus um, parks uh, and recreation facilities to be preserved, which was a part of what they used to call Agenda 21, which is now called Smart Growth. Um, to or get people. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's to get us 
us outlander well me i'm an outlander because i'm way up in the mountain to get us off the land yeah so they can protect everything but my dad in 19 in 1943 1942 1943 to 1946 he was a bombardier um uh, during World War II, and he, I have his journal, okay, he kept a journal, that they were spraying, now, he didn't call it spraying, um, he called it chemical warfare, that's in his, my dad's journal, chemical warfare, where, when they, like, he was first stationed, initially stationed out of the Aleutian Islands, where they would dump chemicals all over North America, wow. it, it had nothing to do with the war, nothing, it was just an experiment to see Science. what would happen. Wow. Yeah, well, these, the forties. So these 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 people who are doing this, Lisa, mm -hmm. what what do you think about them? Do you think they're human? Do you what do you think about this? Yeah, unfortunately they are. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're humans. They're humans, all right. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they had drones back then. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, no, we've had drones since the 1930s, uh, technically. We have. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, they're humans that are just, uh, you know, like you said, it, it's just a big science experiment. Well, the way we love, happen. the way we believe in love, they're the opposite. They believe in hate and suffering and yeah. parasitical behavior and people well, have to I, realize that we, there are parasitical people here who who, who enjoy hurting uh, other humans it's hard for us to imagine because most people don't think that way but they hide in their their little enclaves way up in the in the hierarchies and uh, we got to get these people out of there well, well i think have heard recently that uh speculation that they have created a species of humans within a species of humans and sure, that they've sure. been able to add to the number of or add to their DNA count take the number up and I just saw Lady Gaga in an interview uh, I just seen this here just the last couple of days and she said that exact thing about creating a human species within a human species and something about the old ones or no, don't need them no more. There's this new way. So I think that they're human too, but I think that maybe they've manipulated their DNA and that's what, and they're able to uh, withstand the, these assaults, these chemical assaults on us. Okay, and or they have filters. They have filters in their homes. They have filters for their blood. They they have ways of getting yeah, around yeah, it. Yeah, they're yeah they're. they're I, I I don't think they even need that honestly. So the Department of Defense, um, who I occasionally work with as an independent contractor, um, they they're 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 basically trying to and have been for a really long time to create you know uh, a human hybrid that is immune to um the environment okay mm -hmm. uh, it, and so it's it's working for them to create these hybrids because we're all going to be taken over by these hybrids robots or whatever oh. you know it is but uh, I mean, law. yeah um and this has been the plan all along like it's not it's not new science, it's old science. It, like science fiction, you know, uh, science fiction was created from real science. That's how science fiction writers became uh, famous for writing you know, science fiction novels because yeah. they were already written. Like Minority Report. And that, is a, it's, yeah, it's a perfect example because Star there's all, Wars. Yes, and there's already people being tried in court for pre-crime and released of their own recognizances of, of pre-crime you know i mean it's already in the court system but people just don't just aren't aware of the fact that you can be charged with a criminal act usually that's being captured by a drone right um because they're constantly surveilling us so i'll give you an example so let's say like your neighbor has a dispute the, the, the husband has a dispute with the wife they get into an argument and he gets rough okay he, he's 
slaps her around. I'm not condoning anything. I'm just giving you an example. Yeah, of course. Okay, so, but he's not charged. No one calls anything. But because the drones have captured that incident and they're able to hold it for 10 to 20 years, really, that's the truth, um, they can use that against him in the future as a pre-crime. And that is being in the, that's in the court systems right now. Because they think you're going to do it. You're likely to commit a crime because we saw you, you know, uh, being verbally abusive or you know, if you push your wife or the wife push, pushes well, the husband down on the ground or whatever. I mean, there's, there's so many pressures on people now. They're going to get angry. They're going to, they can't get to the government right now. So they're going to take it out on the people close to them in their, in their own family unit. Right. It's just, it, right. it's part of the, it's part of the oppression. Yeah. Yes. And it's a, it's a money maker. It's a huge money maker. <clears throat> Well, Divorce yeah. is a huge money maker, that's for sure. <laughs> Here in Fresno, we have cameras on every street pole. This whole community is locked down, man. They can see everything with cameras. And then uh, in June, I wrote an article about them installing that shot spotter software, which yeah. is literally hidden cam uh, microphones all over town at their choice they got to pick wherever they want and they went out at nighttime and installed them and that not only did they do it um they did it really without the public knowing that they were doing it and then i sent friends activist friends out and we caught them on an elementary school at 10 p.m at night with mraps Ooh. they installed a shot spotter if, oh my god your vicinity and they were on the campus with all these different caliber guns shooting them so that they could test that shot spotter software so we've got cameras hidden microphones you can't move around this community well without them knowing it they got that minority report here we're the testing market for the country Paula, it's everywhere. There's not yeah. a town in the United States where it isn't. It is everywhere. Yeah, they, it's absolutely everywhere. They know everything. Did you guys uh, see that report? I think it was Washington Post or something about, I think it's New York. They're taking all the phone booths out and they're putting this new little phone booth in where you can go up and there's a microphone and you just uh, get to make a free cell phone call on it. And it hears you and can speak to you so these are going there's like seven thousand i think going to be installed in new york so they'll be able to listen through those and talk to you through those to use well, what you just said lisa okay okay right. but you, you mean there's actually public telephone somewhere in the united states i mean because they've been gone here for decades <laughs> there's no public telephones anywhere it's like the it, it's like part of our history well they're taking all of them out what's left and they're leaving four they're calling them the superman boots because they're the actual closing door but they're installing i think it was like seven thousand and they're just like a little kiosk thing you walk up push a button and then tell them you want to call somewhere and then you well, don't get to pick up a lever or nothing you have to just talk into a little microphone there on the on the okay and there's another thing that's on everybody's cell phone. So there's where all those cameras are that you're talking about, Paula, wherever there's a camera, those cameras can tap into your cell phone mm -hmm. and record what you see, whether you're looking at it or not. So mm -hmm. they're able to, to, yeah, they're able to like record anything, you know, I think what the vicinity is like two to three blocks that your cell phone is now the eyes on everybody. Everybody. It's unbelievable. Think of the yeah. Wi-Fi that exposure that they're going to get in New York having 7,000 of these on every street corner. And everybody's just well, like a... Yeah, Pamela, this is why I, I'd like you to go visit Lisa because she's saying that the air quality there isn't as bad as in the big cities that, that and it's not as dry there. They get lots of rain. So I thought you might find it easier, uh, better for your, uh, you know, your body and your, and your health to yeah, check it out, it. you know, because you, you might feel some relief there and then maybe you might consider, you know, going there and then you can work together on, you know, whatever, you know, 
uh, plans to get out together and stuff because we all have to come together i mean i think some of us are going to survive I th but i think the people that aren't prepared are going to are going to have a rude awakening one of these days yeah that's for sure yeah. yeah, and then Paula, then you and I will go to Norway, you know, I mean, it's, we, we, or, you know, it, or Den or somewhere else, but not, not here, you know, Iceland, Iceland, yes, Iceland, if you I can take the cold. Yeah, Iceland, there, now you're talking. Yeah, well, I got it, I've got, I, yeah, I know people, I know people in eco-villages all over the world, so if you need any connections, I, I know people that live right off the land, grow all their own food, have their own water, have their own industry, micro industries and stuff. Yeah. These people are the ones that are going to survive. I'm telling you, that's the way to go. I was just talking to a couple people about that. Did you see my post about, uh, uh, Jen global eco village network on your, yeah. I, I commented on your post there. Yeah. I think that started it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I put my interview I had with Kasha Joubert, who is just amazing. The woman walks through out of uh, you know out of a home in South Africa. Walks through the you know the uh, war war torn um, country and finds a place where blacks and and whites are living together in peace in an eco village. And she stays there for a while and then she moves to to uh, I think it was Germany. Just a beautiful life story. Yeah. Wow. A very brave woman. Yeah, that is brave. Yeah. All by herself, she walks, takes a big walk for, for miles and miles. Who knows, hundreds of miles. But she said, I'm tired of this nonsense. I'm getting out of here. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, beautiful story. So we all have to take that walk. We all have to find people we can trust. I'm, I'm trying to treat some community in Quebec. Uh, where I want to live is, is going to be nice. Once I get my mom uh, taken care of, uh, I know I'm going to be checking out, uh, you know, uh, there's an area of Quebec I find is very wholesome still, very clean. And the whole province of Quebec, actually, the northern part, is, is quite uh, isolated. And it's uh, I think it's one of the better places to be, too. It's almost a different climate zone uh, than the uh, the southern part. So, yeah. And with the changing uh, climate and all this stuff, uh, you know, it's not as cold as it used to be up there. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, th I think there's going to be some... Uh, yeah, I, my f feeling is you want to go where pe there aren't a lot of people. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, that that's your first uh, criteria. <laughs> well, whatever people are there should be like-minded would be one of my criteria. Yeah, and well, people in Quebec are aware. Uh, they know what's going on. I talked to a lot of people. They, oh yeah, no, no, we know things aren't going so well. Yeah, oh yeah, we know things are uh, really gonna start falling apart soon. And uh, uh, you know, although Canada is nowhere near as bad as the U.S., uh, but uh, no, I, I I feel really I'm really concerned about all my friends in the U.S. that I've met through my show because uh yeah it's you know do you know do you guys know jim uh uh what's his last name me and last names <clears throat> he used to be in the cia he confirms all the depop numbers from 30 300 million down to 30 J jim garrison uh garrow 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 okay yeah yeah g-a-r-r-o-w yeah yeah, he won't go public anymore. He's had too much pressure put on him. He's he used to be number two in the CIA, and he left about three years ago because uh, he was saying that uh, Obama basically was an Islamic terrorist plot plant. And now uh, finally, uh, people like Alex Jones are agreeing with him. So he he got out. You know, he was one of the ones who was very much against the the phony birth certificate and stuff. So he got pushed out. Uh, but he's actually a Canadian. And now he's living, uh, he might be back in Canada, I'm not sure where he is now, but yeah, he, he was very public for a while, but then they, they told him, you better shut up. And well, now uh, actually, Obama was brilliantly crafted. Um, my grandfather worked in Secret Service. Um, uh, he was German, um, von Pelking, uh, Wolfgang von Pelking, um, but he worked for the Americans. And there's, there's this entirely extensive lineage but did he come uh, over in Project Paperclip, Lisa? Oh, I'm very familiar with it. I, my whole, everyone in my family is in intelligence, is CIA or this and that, you know. Which yeah. No, but did your grandfather come with that project the, the from after the war, the Nazis that came over? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Cor and Corley, the first director of the CIA, was my grandfather's very best friend, and groomed him for that position. Um, and it was unfortunate that he came to the end that he did. 
Um, there's a there's a great documentary about uh, William Corley that's called The Man That Nobody Knew, um, and I, I highly recommend it. Anyways, he was a I've never heard of him myself. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Well, he's, the, he's, the first, he's the first director of the CIA. It was, it was William Corley. Anyways. Okay, um, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, he, he was he was the first one. He did the um, the church committee. Uh, you know, he also was uh, on the Watergate committee. Um, but he really stood his ground, and I'll tell you why. Um, because he said, <laughs> because they were at, you know questioning him. In, you know, in, in a court that um, that everyone needs to know um, what the CIA knows, that the public wants to know what the CIA knows. Now, coming from a family of secret intelligence and all of that, uh, we know the obvious answer, but William Corley gave it perfectly. If it wasn't a secret organization, uh, why? I mean, we wouldn't give up that information. It's it's a secret organization. Now, I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with what they withhold, but that's what they're there for. They're there for that very specific reason, um, is to not give up information, which Obama has freely given up. You know, like with the whatever the hoax with the with Osama bin Laden raid and all of that stuff. But anyways, going back to my original point, um, Osama. And uh, 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 Barack Obama was brilliantly crafted by not only the CIA but the Russians. Perfectly, brilliantly crafted, hope and change. Um, but it was the Russians that raised them, him, you know, and uh, and then brought brought him over. Well, first in Pakistan as a CIA agent, and then uh, on to uh, being president of the United States. He yes, you know no. He, he Did he? Do you believe the story, Lisa, that he lived with that actor, that black actor, and he taught him how to act presidential? He admitted that. It goes way beyond that. Most of Barack Obama's training happened in Russia. Um, okay. Okay, and so uh, here's here's the backstory, but I can't confirm it. You know, and I'm sure you guys have probably maybe picked up bits and pieces of. Um, Barack Obama being the son of Malcolm X. You, you guys heard that? No, I haven't heard that. Yeah, I heard he, that his, he, his parents were actually from Kenya and that he, he lived in Hawaii and it, that's when they, they well, concocted the phony the birth certificate. Yeah, that's the Oh, there's that other guy, too. Uh, what's his name? The one they look so much like. Um... Well, that's what I'm saying. This actor ev evidently groomed him. He admitted to it a few places, and then he, he had to he stopped. Uh, you know, I don't know. He he said it in confidence to somebody, and then uh, it, it came out on a radio show, and he denied it. But the uh, the radio uh, alternative radio show host said, "No, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is too juicy to keep confidential." And he got pretty upset and walked out of the interview. But yeah. well, just just Google, just Google um, uh, Barack Obama. Uh, Russian upbringing, and you'll—it's all there. You mm. know, I, I've released most of it, but it's—it's—it's it's, it's mostly there. That's why it's a, a real interesting twist. Yeah. You know, it's not about him being a Muslim. I mean, it is, but it isn't because if he's—if he is, in fact, Malcolm X's son, then yeah, because it, the connection there. But yeah, it's pretty—it's pretty interesting. But they, supposedly he was brought up by the Russians and brilliantly crafted in exchange with the CIA to be um, the president of the United States. And incidentally, it was a fifth grader that um, discovered the fact that Barack Obama was cousins with George W. Bush. True story. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> it's a true story. It really is. It's a true story. It we we should let Warren say story. something. Warren, you haven't said anything, buddy. Are you still with us? I'm here. I'm just listening. I'm just, I'm just being educated. Oh, okay. Well, no, I, I, I kind of felt bad. We kind of lost you. Uh, you know, I mean, we sort of changed the uh, topic completely okay, away we, from. You uh, can have us back again to finish the story. From, from uh, yeah. Is, this, is any everybody okay if we go back to Warren's story? about yeah. the issue of the madness and the magnolias. I know that Pamela, I don't know, how much of that story did you hear? Any of it? I didn't hear anything, Brian, so go wherever you want and I'll tell along. Okay. Yeah, because you... I like Lisa's stories too. 
Oh yeah, no, Lisa's. Uh, I mean, you got to check out her site. I mean, she's really, she's quite amazing. I mean, she has a beautiful summary of of, of Warren's uh, story on her site. That one alone is quite long. Let alone, I don't know. I mean, honest to God, are, do you, are there like three of you, Lisa? You know, I just I like to read um, a lot. You and must like read awful research. fast. <laughs> uh, I do. My it was my grandfather Wolfgang von Pelkeen that taught me how to speed read. Um, which is kind of like an archaic thing now. They they debunked that it doesn't really work. I'm telling you, it does. But um, actually, I spend so much time reading. And with Warren, I mean, because I took him on his word, you know that that you know that, that George W. Bush and Herbert Walker Bush were implicated in the assassin assassination attempt of his father. But I'll tell you what, I didn't waste one second to make sure that that wasn't true. I mean, because I wasn't going to support someone to represent somebody that was just half cocked. He's not. Warren, absolutely, backwards and frontwards, he's telling the truth. It's all validated, 100%. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. So what well, is the story about Warren? Like, can you guys bring me up to speed? It's about so, the true story of Watergate. What it, what the, what the real reason for Watergate was, it was, it was never about a break-in. Uh, G. Gordon Liddy was such an expert at breaking in places and stealing information. If if that was what it was really about, G. Gordon Liddy could have gotten into the Watergate motel and stole everything they had and got out, and nobody would have ever known it. Uh, G. Gordon Liddy was that good. So that was, it was never about the Watergate uh, hotel and stealing information from the Democrats or so it was never about that at all. Uh, that was just an excuse for uh, a, 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 an easy excuse for uh, Richard Nixon to get out of the White House. The real, re the real reason was that Richard Nixon tried to assassinate uh, my father and Governor George Wallace, who at that time was a sitting governor with a governor of a state and uh, was also uh, a, a candidate in a presidential campaign. So Nixon tried to kill, he actually attacked. It had Governor Wallace uh, shot in Laurel, Maryland, uh, in 1972, to in an attempt to kill him, to assassinate him, and uh, was it be well, as, as as Lisa so uh, intelligently uh, pointed out, <laughs> Nixon flubbed up at everything he did. He tried to kill my father. He messed that up. He tried to kill Jack Anderson. He messed that up. He tried to kill George Wallace. He messed that up. And uh, so the word began to get out uh, when uh, the reporters and so forth uh, were beginning to interview Wallace and well, Governor, by now you ought to have some idea of who and why and uh, how uh, uh, these people tried to kill you. And he didn't talk about it much, but on several occasions he said, well, I'm not sure, but I think Richard Nixon had something to do with my assassination attempt. And then the word began to spread that Nixon might be involved. And this was in uh, late 72 and 73. And so, uh, as Lisa said, uh, Nixon was taking the drugs, was taking a lot of drugs. All the presidents were on drugs just about. Mm -hmm. And so these drugs made, uh, made Nixon very, very, very uh, paranoid. And he was so paranoid, he was scared to death that he might be uh, impeached and maybe even sent to prison. Uh, for trying to assassinate a governor and presidential candidate. And I remember back then, that was 30, I mean, 45 years ago, and uh, back way back then, uh, uh, it was it was deemed possible that a, a president uh, could be impeached and, and possibly imprisoned. So Nixon was scared to death of being imprisoned, and so uh, he wanted to he wanted to uh, get out of the White House uh, so that he would not be charged with the attempted assassination of a governor and a presidential candidate and his campaign chairman. And so he, again, once again, he called his team together of uh, H.W. Bush and, and G. Gordon Liddy and, and uh, uh, the, the plumbers, uh, his, what we call his assassination uh, team. Uh, it was really the plumbers, as Lisa said. And, and said, okay, you guys, uh, you know, I don't want to go to, uh, we can imagine the conversation, but I don't want to go to prison for having to uh, trying to assassinate Governor Wallace, uh, 
I, I gotta have a better excuse than that to get out of the White House. And so they uh, concocted this uh, Watergate story of uh, breaking into the war breaking into the uh, White House, uh, the Watergate hotel and getting caught and Nixon being charged with the uh, uh, being behind the Watergate scandal and uh, that would give him an excuse to leave the White House without without having to go to prison or uh, being charged with anything and uh, it was just an easy way for Nixon to get out of the White House and it also protected uh, Daddy Bush because H.W. Bush knew that he was going to run for president and he couldn't and if uh, Richard Nixon had gotten in trouble uh, for the assassination of Donald Wallace and my father, it would certainly have implicated uh, Daddy Bush, H.W. Bush, and that would have possibly ruined his chances uh, of running for president. Uh, so he had, uh, you know, he had a, a real reason to get Nixon out of the White House without any trouble, to, to protect Nixon and to protect himself. And uh, so they all came up with this Watergate idea uh, to get Nixon out of the White House in a, in a very easy uh, manner without any charges being brought against him. And that was the real reason for Watergate, not, uh, that was the real reason for Richard Nixon leaving the White House. It wasn't Watergate, it was the assassination of Governor Wallace and my father uh, in the early 70s. That's, that's, the, uh, that's the short version of the story. <laughs> that's, the, that's, that's the game changer of, of Nixon stepping down and the whole Watergate scandal. Nixon created, had to create, the Watergate scandal in order to be, you know, either impeached or to step down because he didn't want to be implicated on the assassination attempt of a presidential candidate and his campaign advisor, who's Warren's dad, Seymour Trammell. That is a tr that is the true story, which Simon and Schuster, you know, the ones that had um, enlisted historian uh, Dan T. Carter to write about. But when, but when they, he actually presented the facts and, and they spent millions of dollars, right, Warren? I mean, on investigating, right. yeah, right. on the IRS, they investigated the IRS, spent millions of dollars investigating if Warren's dad, Seymour Trammell, actually was telling the truth. When they found out he was telling the truth, they decided to decline on really letting the real story out. <laughs> so they came up with the whole, they just went with the whole Watergate scenario scandal, which n none of it's true. It was all fabricated by Nixon. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, and where, where are things with the book, uh, Lisa, in terms of getting it out there and stuff? What, can you give us an update on that? I can't give you a lot of the specifics, um, but I can say that Simon and Schuster, the ones that hold all the legal rights to the IRS files that prove uh, Seymour Trammell's um, accusations, um, are the ones that withheld the information initially, but they're also the ones that are now considering um, doing the book. I probably said too much, but anyways, there it is. <laughs> we just can't release any names, Brian. Yeah, oh, you I can't. Oh, release. okay. You, you don't want to do anything publicly. Okay. Yeah, I heard some big names come up, but I won't say them. I wanted really, to be sure. Really big names, yeah. Yeah. The, the biggest names that there are, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good to hear. So, uh, but you, what do, you, do you expect to get a decision within a year, or uh, what do you think? Well, it should be less than a year, but there's negotiations right now going on between um, three different publishers. So we'll see which one comes up with the, you know, most adequate offer. But I'm telling you, Warren and I have, well, Warren's been at this much longer than I have. But I mean, every, I, I've talked to, like, I can, I can say some names, Douglas Brinkley, who's the foremost authority on his history right now, he's on CNN, MSNBC all the time. He's referred to as the no wall be all. He was so excited um, about publishing this. And then there was like a come to Jesus moment, forgive the phrase, um, where it's like, it was like, well, wait a minute. That means everything I've ever written about Nixon and history wouldn't be accurate. <laughs> 
I mean, that's what he said. And, and he said, I can't do it. <laughs> so he, so he'd rather be wrong in his right, you know, or right in his wrong thinking or however that would go. But because it really is going to change everything about history as we know it in politics, in particular, you know, the Watergate scandal, Nixon, who's the most notorious president that's ever been. So yeah, it would really mean historians would have to, everything that they've written would be, would be inaccurate. And that's like a bone of contention, apparently, within the historian community. Interesting. Absolutely. That's a true story, Brian. Interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, let's let's face it. I mean, the, the, you know, most people are giving in to the, uh, the the dominant ideology. So, yeah, they don't want to uh, they don't want to lose their nice position. They're probably their good income. Their their good position within the media. Whatever. You know what I mean? You know. No, what I what, let let me add to that that the so that we've had several different um, historians and publishers um, interested, but the bottom line has come to this throughout that the attorneys that represent like the publishing companies said that they would be years in litigation um, for accusing high profile individuals like. George W. Bush and his dad, Herbert Walker Bush, it would just be too astronomical. They said, they said that it would just it would just take too long and too expensive to actually bring formal charges, which is not what we asked for. I mean, yeah, it's what we want, but we're not asking for that. But but it would require like a formal investigation, just like the CIA's torture reports, you know, and um, and all of that, like formal investigations, it gets to be very expensive. And when you've got two former presidents implicated in the assassination attempt of our presidential elect and his campaign director, including yeah, Nixon, <laughs> yes, it, yeah, it, it becomes pretty serious and expensive uh, litigation. And that's why we've been turned down so far. Wow. So you've been you've been working with what what four years now? You've been working with Warren and. Uh... Warren, how long have you had the uh, the manuscript from your dad? Well, uh, it's an interesting part of the story. Uh, he was uh, uh, in prison uh, in the uh, mid '70s. Spent two years in federal prison uh, here in Alabama. And uh, as uh, Lisa said the other day, he was a uh, such a well-known person and had so many friends. Uh, when he got out to the federal prison. Uh, he discovered he had all, you know, everybody, everybody out there wanted to be his friend. All the guards wanted to be his friends. <laughs> all the inmates wanted to be his friends because they gave him free legal advice. And all the guards were his friends. And the guards actually gave him keys to the officers out there and gave him access to a typewriter. Uh, now, he didn't have a dictionary because uh, we didn't have the internet back then. Um, he didn't have a dictionary, so everything that he typed and spelled and so forth uh, was all just you know just from memory, and all the facts he had you know, could, you know couldn't look up anything. So so everything he typed was from his memory, but it was fresh. It was fresh on his mind, and he wanted to type it out while it was still fresh on his mind. And so during that two-year period, as Lisa said, he would type out seven or eight, nine pages a day, and every day uh, I would go visit him uh, for two years. Every day I took a newspaper to him. And uh, we would go out into the visitation area, and uh, whatever, you know, five or six or seven pages he had typed that day, he would uh, slip it into the newspaper, and uh, I would carry it out. And that's how we, that's how we sneaked it out. As Lisa said, it was back during that era, it was totally illegal for an inmate to write anything about his case, and it was certainly illegal uh, for me to take it out. So we were taking a, a very big risk, and. Uh, the uh, and he was not allowed any visitors. Uh, the rest of the inmates out there could have all the visitors they wanted. They could go to a trade school. They could, you know, leave. They had a lot of privileges. My father was strictly uh, forbade, uh, uh, you know, to go out anywhere. They they would not let him off the compound at all. Period. And I was the one and only person that was allowed to come visit him. 
uh, his wife and uh, 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 they were in a to get a divorce, but uh, the uh, feds would not allow, you know, his wife to come see him or anybody else. I was the only person that was allowed to come see my father during that two-year period. And I, uh, you know, sneaked out the manuscript, the whole, the whole 232 pages, uh, sneaked it out five or six pages at the time over a two-year period. And, so that's we, and what that's we what got it out. and what was uh, so that two year period? What what was what year that was that? Uh, that he was in prison. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, <clears throat> 1973 uh, and 74. And he did that because was he afraid he wouldn't get out of prison alive? Is that why he wanted to write it then and not well, after he well, got out? Well, he, he was because he he was under such strict uh, observation. He was not allowed any visitors. He, he was actually sentenced to uh, four years. And, uh, but uh, we, uh, me and a friend of his, went to the uh, uh, federal uh, probation office uh, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., and both of us testified before the federal probation board. And uh, about, oh, probably about a month after we testified, uh, they let him out. And I granted him a uh, granted him a parole at the end of two years, and uh, they were looking down the road, and Wargate was going on uh, during that time, and what we discovered was that uh, uh, within a few months of uh, my father being paroled, uh, they sent uh, Nixon's uh, friend and buddy, his Attorney General John Mitchell, John Mitchell. Uh, was sent to the same federal prison that my father was sent to. And, and he was, John John Mitchell is really key in all of this, I just want to point out, because, yeah, uh, yeah he, he's the one, he was so, John Mitchell was, I mean, thought he was Nixon's right-hand man, it, it tr entrusted and all of that stuff, and, and that he would never turn on him. And, and then all of a sudden, John Mitchell finds himself um, in, in the same prison that um, that Warren's dad was in, and and, and his, because his of Watergate, dad, because of Watergate, right? Yes, because he he insisted. To, I mean, he insisted to. He used to call his dad had just gotten out of prison, and he insisted. Look, Seymour, I just want you to know I didn't rat you out because he was worried that because Seymour had been in prison there that he was that Seymour was going to have someone kill him, and and he was and Seymour was nothing but gracious and kind and bought him nice expensive meals that were catered from the steak shop to the prison for him and that's isn't that right warren when everything yeah. started to come together with, right. with the whole story yeah that's that's when everything came together because john mitchell is the one that basically spilled the beans uh, uh, uh john mitchell was given telephone privileges and then for the next several months uh, John Mitchell would call my father uh, at home where he was living <laughs> and my father had an unlisted phone number and John Mitchell got his unlisted phone number and would call him every day and uh, so during those several months uh, uh, John Mitchell told my father all the details of, of the uh, Watergate debacle and uh, all of the assassination and, uh, and that's really where we learned that uh, uh, w. Bush and Daddy Bush was involved in the assassination was through uh, John Mitchell. And this was after your dad got out. Uh huh. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Cool. That that's where the story really uh, came into fruition. It is because John Mitchell was so fearful of his life because he he figured that because he was so close to Nixon that he was that he was narking on Seymour, you know, or, or, or creating fabrications about him that he he was so worried about his his life that he's called to Seymour and and spilled basically spilled the beans. I mean Seymour was putting the pieces together already he and then he and Warren together after he got out of prison. But when John Mitchell called him, um then it everything kind of came to a cohesive nasty mess did your dad ever speak publicly about this kind of stuff Warren no uh, -uh. uh we we tried several times but it was such an at that time in history it was such an outrageous story 
Uh, nobody wanted to hear about it. <laughs> All of his friends were scared to death. Uh, we had a couple of his close friends uh, read the manuscript, and I said, oh, Seymour, listen, you take this manuscript and you get away from me. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to have anything to do with this because I'm afraid. I'd be afraid for my life, and they were, because during the during the time, uh, you know, way before this, where uh, Nixon was investigating and had all the IRS people in Alabama to uh, investigate Wallace and the father and all those people, uh, they sent IRS people to all the banks and all the friends. Um, they audited everybody. They came to the University of Alabama to find out who paid for my college, who bought my car, uh, who paid for my membership in the country club there, and who paid for my clothes, or who paid for my book. They wanted to know it, everything about me at the University of Alabama was what, who, who paid for it. And uh, they did that with everybody. They went down to South Alabama and, and uh, audited uh, all of Seymour's brothers and sisters. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you said they sent in truckloads or busloads of, uh, uh, um, what do you call them, auditors. Yeah, sure, the plane loads. There were dozens and dozens <laughs> of planes that, that landed in Montgomery at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base, uh, sent by the president to investigate everybody that, if you knew George Wallace, you got, you got audited. You got an IRS audit. <laughs> Well, and the sad truth of it also is that it 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 really destroyed Warren's own family. You know, I mean his 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 wife was worried, sick. I mean, and, and I can understand. You know, paranoid as hell because there were threats on his life, their kids' lives. I mean, it was like yeah. really a scary situation, and um, it it really and it and, it's, and it certainly has not served Warren in any way. It, it's really hard. Alabama, I, I mean, it, you know, it's a state, but it's also a small town. So it's it's really hard, you know, to live down his father's legacy, even though his, his dad didn't do anything wrong. He was wrongfully accused, wrongfully indicted, but it's really hard to get along in such a, you know, close-knit um, community um, like that, like in Alabama, um, it, it just, it hasn't been easy. And, and, and trust me, Warren deserves his just desserts. He, he really, it's been a long time. He promised his dad that he would get this story out, that it would one day be published. Um, and so myself, and, and thankfully, you know, Brian, you helping out, getting the story out is it's really it's really important on so many levels. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, I didn't want to sound Absolutely. like I was insensitive. It's just it's just it's just so ridiculous. This whole layer of government. It, it's so obvious that it's there to create, you know, uh, it's just another wing of the of the uh, elite to, to use to oppress us whenever they, they feel they need the uh, desire to. And, the fact that all these people who are accountants would play along with this stuff. I mean, on it should have been pretty obvious to them what was going on. Uh, you know, oh, it's well, so just silly. Like, like Hillary Clinton and Benghazi, you know, um, I mean, this, this, these charades just keep going on and on and on. Yeah. I mean, and no one's going to be just, you know, just like with uh, George W. Bush invading the Middle East. That thing was crafted back in 1972. I mean, it's been, literally, it's this, these things are long overdue for being um, exposed for what they really are. But are we going to see it in our lifetime? Not if we have presidents that keep the very first thing that Barack Obama did was forgive um, George W. Bush from any crimes against humanity. Yeah, yeah. it's a, it, it just. He, he forgave him. That was the, the very one of the very first things he did. It's despicable. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unbelievable. They're all buddy buddies. Absolutely. Well, yeah. it, it's a written law. It's called AB 106. Okay, it's a law where it's the same reason that um, um, Eric Holder couldn't hold any of the banks responsible for the wrongdoing is because those were his clients. So there's this, this, this clause called the confidentiality clause in law. And it means you can't narc on each other. You can't tell on each other. You can't expose um, others' wrongdoings within the judicial system. It's true. 
you, you can't do it. And uh, and that's but that's how they're able to get away with it and not be held responsible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, well, the complexity of the legal system is yeah another way they hide all this stuff. Yeah, and they can keep going and going and going forever. Yeah, fighting it out, duking it out. Yeah, yeah. That's why I, you know, I'm a big proponent of making things simple again and starting small towns and, and getting away from this complexity because I don't think there's a way out of it. Using the system, you have to just basically divorce yourself from it. Lead by example, Brian. We talked about that when I was on your show, remember? Yeah. Yeah, just just do it. Just see how it works out. Got to, we got to start playing with ideas. That was the uh, the treehouse project I told you that I tried to do. You know, you know that I, I gifted everything in that little thrift store was a gift. So, and then if somebody wanted to give me something in return for, well, that was kind of on them, and it actually worked out pretty well. Had I not get got sick, I'd probably still be giving things away for free. Paula, is it okay for me to ask? You, you, you said you're sick. It's and, Pamela. And Brian, it's, it's Pamela, Pam, not Paula. Pamela, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, it'll never happen again. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, and, and Brian alluded to it. Uh, so are you unwell because of the environmental uh, subjectivity of the poisons yeah. in the atmosphere? Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that I'm, I'm toxic. I'm like a toxic dump because I mean I've just been the last six seven years it's just been a slow steady well now it's accelerated decline and weird these weird things you know like uh, a frozen shoulder do you guys know anybody who's ever had a frozen shoulder um only after I got like injected in my neck but I mean but that was a chemical no. thing that was like a year of uh, your joint, your shoulder aching and just getting progressively worse until one day you wake up and it's like you're giving birth at your shoulder and your shoulder doesn't move anymore. You cannot raise your arm. It's just stuck to your sides like somebody super glued it. Um, it took a year for that to happen, a year to recover. As soon as I got better, I had the other shoulder free. So whatever it is, is attacking my joint severely. Now my hips are going. Um, I've got a, a some kidney failure going on. Uh, my memory's really bad. My oh, short-term. Okay, really have you have you been tested for Lyme's disease? Yeah. No, okay. There's only one place in 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 North America that can actually do um, an accurate test because most of them are like false positives you know and they're like you know because they don't really want to cure you not that they can it's too late yeah. you're done right. you know it's all over with but it's called um um not not eugenics but igenics i igenics i g n x um and it's in uh, palo alto uh california and it's the only lab that can actually give you an accurate um, true, you know, result on if you do have Lyme's disease, because Lyme's disease, it, it affects every part of you, your brain, mind fog, your body. Yeah. I mean, it's actually really serious. My nephew yeah. has it. My nephew has it. Lyme yeah. Disease. Well, I think that most of us have, I think that what, what people call like fibromyalgia, which predominantly affects women, is Lyme's disease. That's what I um, think too. Yeah, it is. It, but that's the old Igenix is the only lab that can. But it. But your insurance isn't going to cover it. They won't cover that test. I mean, they just don't do it. They don't want you to know because no. the, the, the the because the the treatment is almost. I mean, they there is treatment for it, but it, it if you if it's like brain fog and they try to treat it for like brain fog or. Um, or hip pain or anything, it just moves around the body. And if you've had it for more than two years, it's everywhere. I have a uh, I have a a, re a recent email from someone who who, who followed a very uh, a fairly involved protocol, but it was all natural based stuff. And she 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 said she got over her uh, Lyme disease. I can share that with you if you want, Pamela. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please do because it's it, it's it's. I mean, unless she was recently like uh, by the time that she got treatment affected it's really hard i've i have um it where i live there's nine people that are personal friends of mine that have been 
chest, uh, tested through this iGenix laboratory in Palo Alto that turned out positive. That means it's freaking rampant, right? Wow. That's I mean, that's nine friends of mine, really good friends of mine, and myself. I have Lyme's disease. Um, and it, it is, it is, but they don't, but my doctor, my primary care physician is like, oh, yeah, well, you know, and. I can yeah, send it to you too, Lisa. This uh, this email I got, yeah, you know, from uh, someone. Her her grandmother's a, a spiritual leader in the uh, for the indigenous people, uh, and uh, she uh, yeah she did us she went through all this protocol. A guy named Wilson, Doctor Wilson, and um, yeah, she said it really helped. And it, but it's fairly involved. I mean, it's not a simple process, but you have to be consistent with it. But she did, it actually really helped her overcome the uh, all the symptoms of Lyme disease yeah. yeah please yeah please send it to me because I I, I mean I, I'm a part of numerous different groups that are really trying to get a hold of this why it's affecting women more than men I'm not sure um but I just know that it's it, it really is a serious disease that you guys probably know was created you know by well actually originally by the Japanese and then and then they introduced it to us in um the, up in the east coast area well, lime island yeah well, lime island yeah 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 well yeah well, well that's lime where my uh, nephew lives who got it yeah he lives in connecticut it's really yeah, bad it's there connecticut yeah i mean it's uh, it's real serious stuff i mean but they've been doing stuff i mean it's just like what we're talking about spring with chemtrails um it, it's just i mean if we're not hit one way we're hit another way i mean it's just it deterioration of our our bodies in, in this environment because we're all just an experiment yeah yeah well I, I the last five years have been real hard on me I you know I really I think it was 2013 was so sick I was like I'm dying and you know you can just tell and so I took drastic measures. Like I went to my dentist to take all my mercury fillings out, put me to sleep, you know, give me some Valium, let me take them all out <laughs> now, you know. So I mean, I, I took a, a lot of uh, a lot of action, but did it help? Did it make a difference or not? Yes, it did actually. But um, I, I I did a couple other things. I don't really want to talk publicly about, but I sure several things and then I ended up with a neurological um, if I don't know my body just started having tremors and it was really weird you guys ever seen that video of that uh, cheerleader who has tremors but if she walks backward it stops oh that's kind of like me skiing backwards yeah I know I do have tremors well, yes yeah, I know yeah really bad tremors I couldn't control it but if I walk backward it would stop dystonia is what it's called dystonia yeah that's right yeah, yeah it is so I had that I was in the hospital for weeks and they couldn't figure out nothing I was like you guys are gonna kill me I gotta get out of here <laughs> so I, I did I left and um it just kind of went away uh, so just really weird stuff but it was weird because I was living up in Crater Auberry which is uh a of by Yosemite. I got out of the valley about five years ago. And um, I noticed in the spring that my property would be covered in a yellow dust, like the legal pad yellow. Like Yes, I, I we get yeah, we get that here, but it's from flour. the oak trees. It was like someone uh, baking flour, but it was yellow. Mm -hmm. And the second year it happened is when I had those tremors. So I don't know if it was from the surgeries and getting the fillings out and maybe I was detoxing, I got tremors, or if it was that yellow powder that fell up there. So they spray something up there in the spring. I have people watching to see if it happens again this year um, up in there. Because I, I, I don't know. Have you guys seen any yellow powder where you are? Well, I do where I live, but that's because we have oak trees. and it's the oak pollen. trees. They have always had the yellow powder, you know, in springtime. It's like a dust, it, and it covers like your windshield on your car. It's like a really soft, fine dust. Mm -hmm. But the deers love it because it, it it puts out this beautiful little purple bloom on these tender leaves that they eat. But otherwise, yeah, all of us suffer from allergies, um, and it, and it covers everything. But I think it, it must be something different because ours is our ours. It, it, it's just historically true of the oak trees. We have the wild oak, the black oak, the live oak, um, and that's just historically true for these trees. But 
You need to come down here. A friend of mine owns one of the top five spas in the world. And it's just over the border in Takati and it's a healing center. Oh, okay. um, and it's really amazing. It's 500 acres and it's- In Mexico? Grow... Yeah, in Takati, Mexico. It's, yes. Okay. Yeah, um, and it's, they really, and the woman that owns it ha just happens to have Lyme's disease. So there, there's a lot of emphasis on knowledge, lectures, recovery, diet. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, it's called Rancho La Puerta. Well, you seem um, to have a lot of energy, Lisa, for someone with Lyme disease. So you feel uh, feel like you've overcome it? Oh, God, no. I just have a lot of energy. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm not, I suffer all the time. I mean, they've given me, I can't even tell you how much, I mean, I've been under, I was, I, they gave me 160 milligrams of Oxycontin a day, plus um, four doses of 10 milligram Percocet. My doctor here said I would be dead. It, I mean, I couldn't walk or function. I was a, just a highly functioning, you know, Oxycontin person. Um, and I didn't even know, I mean, I just, I was, I, I've been in so much pain, but I'm not on anything now. Zero painkillers. And I don't feel any worse than I did. I feel better now that I'm off of all the painkillers because they didn't work. Because you can't drugs, touch. The drugs yeah. make it worse. They do. The drugs make it worse. They really Turn you do. into a drug addict. Oxycontin's uh, the worst. 160 milligrams a day. Yes. I, I don't remember what they had me on, but it was enormous amounts of stuff, pain it's, pills and sleeping pills because with a frozen yeah. shoulder, you're in so much pain, like you've got a broken arm 24 hours, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I, I just couldn't take it. And I got off all of it and just started taking, you know, changing my diet, magnesium, things that I hadn't are, been doing. Are you, uh, oh. are you guys uh, drinking structured water? Do you know what I that do. is? I do distilled water. Mm-hmm. Well, there's no minerals in it. Structured water is a water that's uh, created by a process, that, uh, usually a spinning magnet. Um, I had my third show. You should listen to it on on my uh, podcast. Uh, is a Dr. John Apsley. Can you he, send it to us? Can you just can you send it? Can you send me at least that link? I can send yours? you the link, sure. But it's on yeah. my podcast site. But you see it. But it's it's a shorter one because we had issues connecting. But it's only about an hour and fifteen. But he did all sorts of research. He actually knows the guy who created the MRI. Everybody's cells should have a rainbow. Uh, in them because you're, you're actually in each cell the water is polarized it's right. fascinating I mean actually little like each cell is like a little world up to itself yeah. and if your water isn't pure and if your water isn't uh, able to do this polarization it creates all sorts of health problems uh, cancer uh, all sorts of immune issues and uh, so he, he's a big proponent of a structured water and uh, I know a friend, uh, Tim Butts, who's, uh, who's uh, got, he lives in California, too. And he, uh, God, this guy's super healthy. Uh, he's just an incredible guy. And he, he, he has a special uh, routine he goes by. But he has a structured water unit after he filters it, filters it at his house. And I would think anybody who's got a chronic illness uh, of any sort, I think that the structured water might help. Yeah. I drink, we, we, uh, for me, we've got well water, but it's, it's tested and it's a natural spring water. So it's running. Um, but I also live in a, what used to be a gold mining town, you know, actually, it, I mean, people still do mine gold here. So in other words, that means it's, there's chemicals, you know, in the soil because of the processing of mining gold. Um, but but our water is pretty good. It tests pretty good. But I'm interested in anything I can get my hands on that might make a difference. Well, yeah, structured water is like I don't structure my water. I, you know, I, like I'm I'm very fortunate. I mean, I've never uh, <clears throat> other than after my dad died, I got pneumonia. I haven't been sick since I was like 10. Um, so I've been very fortunate. Uh, Lucky you. Wow, that's great. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I blame it on my angel. It's her fault. I told her to leave me alone, but she won't, so she keeps me healthy. Well, it's a good thing. 
Yeah, <laughs> I can't complain. I'm teasing you. Um, we need we need to get this suction in water, uh, Ryan. It, it might even help my diabetes. Well, Tim, like I say, Tim Butts is your man. Uh, Warren knows Tim. Well, uh, Tim is an expert in greenhouse in indoor growing. He's a uh, he's a big proponent of that because then it protects us from all the toxins if you grow your food indoors. And he's he's developing uh, a he's developed a system where you filter everything, the water and the air and everything, because he's quite aware of all the toxins out there. So. What, oh, you mean out where Warren lives, or or just well indoors? everywhere. You know, he 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 promotes uh, growing everything indoors. Yeah. We, we don't hardly have any here. We're so sorry, I haven't been to Oxford. We, uh, we don't pay much attention to us. Well, Warren, Warren thinks it's clean there, but it, it probably might. It's, it's a matter of, uh, uh, you know, degree, right? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. I, I, I need the instruction uh, part of it, you know, with the, uh, <clears throat> with, with the molecules and atoms and, you know, are, work, work right in your cells. And the water, and you have the right kind of water in your cells. Yeah. yeah, John Apsley, uh, did you read, the blueprints, uh, the did anybody read the book after Fukushima about how to detox for radiation? I, I did, and I did it, yeah. John Apsley uh, wrote the book, uh, the, the, yeah, he's, he's a brilliant guy. He also uh, was inspired to become a naturopath by a visit to Finhorn, which is one of my favorite places in the world. I'll have to get there sometime. Yeah, it's an yes. eco village in uh, northern Scotland. Okay, I'm getting this link for you guys. I'm going to throw it in the chat box. Okay? Okay, thank you. For my, that interview with John Apsley. <clears throat> yeah. And I mean, you might want to contact him. I, I, I'm not sure if he has it. But uh, Tim Butts is, uh, for, you know, proof. to me, the proof is in the pudding. The guy is super healthy. He's, like, he's 55. He works outdoors all the time. He's constantly doing stuff. He's like a construction kind of guy, but... And, uh, it, you know, it doesn't hurt to be active, but, I mean, he is very healthy, and he also has certain protocols that he goes by. There's a site called the Hall Hallelujah Diet or something. Have you heard of that one? No. no. Yeah, it's something he, he thinks is quite good. It's somewhat Ayurvedic, too, which is another powerful uh, medicine oh, that yeah. we don't yeah, understand. I, yeah, I, uh, Ayurvedic works for me. Like, so my dosha is like Vata Pitta, um, and it really does. But, I mean, I make, like, my date rolls, uh, you know, uh, with, with coconut crumbles. I, I really feel like there's no one's going to get hurt by Ayurvedic treatment. It just, it really seems to work, really, it, it, for me and for, obviously, millions of other people. But I highly recommend it. Yeah, no, I I have a, I had a two-year conversation with a guy who was uh, quite advanced in Ayurveda. Uh, it was a, he was a teach he was actually learning but he knew more than most people I know who are Ayurveda practitioners. He, he understood the energy medicine so war, component. So Warren Ayurvedic is basically the um, the East Indian understanding of how our what our um, what our dosha is is like what our our own internal environment is kind of is a way to kind of describe it. But then, okay. It's easy. It's easy to diagnose yourself. You can just go online and just type in what is my dosha um, or Ayurvedic and and figure out. It's it's pretty pretty easy. I'm gonna say that you're probably Pitta, Pitta Vada or Vada Pitta, but you're not Kapha. Um, I know you're not because I've seen pictures of you and I know you. Um, so uh, you're not that. But it really it's it's a and it might really help you know with the, the diabetes. It really would help. Very good. I will, uh, if you can, uh, if you can spell I'll send that, it. I'll send, I'll it, send it to me, guys. Yeah, Actually, um, uh, my uh, my friend who's very advanced thinks that that kind of stuff is a joke. To be honest with you, um, there's a few people that really understand this stuff well. Um, I can share this site with. Uh, what you need to do is get your chart done. Uh, it's well, called I don't think you do. I mean, I think you can self diet I mean, I, I mean, I can self-diagnose. And what I, I went to the, um, the, I know this kind of sounds cliche, Brian, but I went to the, the Chopra Center because it's here in La Jolla, where it's not too far from where I live. Yeah. Um, Deepak, Deepak Chopra. Um, and I, but I already diagnosed myself because it's pretty simple to like figure out what your constitution is. He, he detests Deepak Chopra. <laughs> 
he well, simplifies everything too much. He does. I mean, but that's what he's there for. He's there to simplify everything. But yeah. I tested my – I mean, I already figured out what my dosha was before I even went to him. But his facility is phenomenal. I've never met him, but he's never there. Um, but it really is. It's right on the coast in La Jolla. It's just great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I say, I mean, I, I had was offered a dosha through my yoga training, and then I did my chart, and he said, no, 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 your dosha is not that. And well, what so is we your changed dosha, it. Ryan? My dosha is uh, Kapha, uh, Kapha Vada. It yeah. is? Yeah. I'm surprised. I mean, because I've seen pictures of you, but yeah. I'm surprised. Well, I, I'm almost tridoshic, but uh, I, those are my thing. I'm a bit, yeah. I'm pretty pitted too, but I, I really have to work hard at focusing and being uh, logical. I don't really, it's not natural for me, if you know what I mean. But I do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I do it because you have to be that way in order to survive in this world. So, uh, in other but words, it isn't my you natural inclination. So you work at it. So because yeah. if you're, I mean, because but to me the kapha is like thick. Oily, dark, you know, like thick, bigger, you know, larger, not not fat, but I mean, more European, you know, like, or East Indian, like thick, oily, dark. Is that you? It doesn't look like you. Um, well, I usually have dark skin. My skin is oily. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, you look, you, you look about as airy as they can be as far as I'm concerned, but... <laughs> Well, to me, see, kapha is actually love. Uh, kapha is more love. Uh, it's very complicated stuff. I mean, it's not a simple thing. Uh, it's it's probably the most complicated metaph metaphysical system on the planet. Yes, but it's one of the original ones. I mean, it's been around for... Oh, yeah, but I mean, in order yeah. to understand it uh, at any level of a depth, you really have to study this stuff. You almost have to be born into the lineage this is not simple stuff. This is more complicated than theoretical physics. No, well, um, I think it might. I mean, I, I think for me, uh, yeah, I haven't gotten in, in, incredibly too in depth with it. But what resonates with me is when I follow the uh, Pitavada, which is what I am. Yeah. Um, and the diet that's recommended, it works for me. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you, you try things. I mean, this guy, he said, oh, you could never tell me when you were born unless you, your, your mother told you. So I, I said, well, I'll tell you when I was born and try it. I mean, the actual time, because my mother would never remember to do my chart. I said, well, I was born at four in the morning. That's what I'm, that's what I'm being told by my angel. And he laughed. He said, oh, I'll try it, but I doubt it's right. Well... Everything lined up perfectly. All my kids and everything lined up in my chart. So I said, "Oh, I guess you're right." <laughs> so, based on your based on your Ayurvedic, because Ayurvedic, I mean, I guess for me, it's Yotish. Yotish is uh, the uh, Vedic form of astrology. Uh, Western astrology yes, is a, yes. is a cheap uh, cutout from it, because That's in order to do yeah. it right, you have to be you have to be born into the lineage. You have to have uh, be taught yes. this from the day you're born. Right, but it, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't matter so much about what month or year or time. It it's your lineage. It does have more to do with your lineage, your ancestral lineage, than actually the time and date of your birth. Don't you agree? Well, I mean, I'm talking to understanding this this philosophy of life. You have to be born into it. You have to be taught this from day one. That's what I'm saying. This is not a simple philosophy like Western thought. It's extremely difficult and complex. And you have to meditate, too. You have to know how to meditate. You have to have a meditation uh, like a guru who teaches you. Everybody's dosha, everyone is, uh, everybody's mantra is different. It's based on your dosha. So you have to get all this stuff right or it won't work. Well, it's, I, it's extremely complicated. I, everybody who's been taught this stuff uh, by our uh, local kind of people like yogis and stuff, they're not getting the real goods. I'm telling. I, I just shared a site with you, uh, Sanjay Roth. Uh, you listen to this guy. I mean, he's okay, really I into it. it. Yeah. He is. This guy is the and and the, the terminology and the, the complexity of it is just it blows you away. Well, but I this guy can predict. I'm telling I, you, this stuff. He can predict everything that's going to happen in your life. I think that Warren in particular would benefit, but just by like, I mean, yeah. It is complex, but I think that he would benefit because he is diabetic, 
and would benefit by looking at, um, based on his constitution, on the like kind of you know superficial level, maybe. Um, of, of what he needs to eat because it's vital to his survival. Oh yeah, I mean it's everything's trial and error in my life. So yeah, try something as long as it's good, uh, just food. It can't hurt you. And if that's what Ayurveda is all about: the perfect diet. It's all yeah. about the perfect diet. Yeah. yeah. And I think he he would benefit by it because and they're in Alabama. I, I guess they don't really get good, great food. Hey, 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 Warren, did you did you read my post about that Alabama is the most corrupt state in the United States? Is he gone? <laughs> is it, that was his exit cue or what? Well, Warren just said goodnight. Oh. Is it, well, it's all right. He just typed out. <laughs> I'm still here. Is Warren still there? Is he, is he gone? I think... Uh, Oh, maybe he just said goodnight to Pam. I think Warren's still with us. Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> what were you doing, sleeping? <laughs> no, I took my JFK power nap this afternoon. Le uh, Lisa, out. I should show you. I kept the script of our conversation with this top Ayurvedic guy, and we went into very deep metaphysical stuff. And man, right. it's, it's a fascinating script. I, uh, I'd have to get his permission because he said he wouldn't want this information shared, but... I'm okay, telling well, yeah, you right I mean, now. I'd love to see it. You start you reading the Upanishads. I mean, not not the Upanishad, the Vishnu Purana, and that is incredibly difficult to figure out. Uh, well, I mean, it is, is, but so is the Course of Miracles. I mean, so so are a lot. So is Proust Swan's Way. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things that are really difficult. It took me five years to even glimpse what what Proust was saying in Swan's Way. And that doesn't have anything to do with metaphysics. It's just, uh, you know, Proust. But, I mean, and, and The Course of Miracles, it took me 10 years to get it because I've always been trying to undo my, you know, uh, religious upbringing. You know, and the last thing I wanted to do was, like, dive back into it. But I did go to seminary school because there is a, there is a calling for me um, to understand it because I, I needed to make some kind of sense of all those years dedicated to the false idols um but anyways i mean yeah it does it takes time it does take time well no it takes many lifetimes to understand this stuff vedic uh systems are really for the uh mature spirits that have lived many lives uh they're not meant for the west and uh, my friend actually spent 25 years on the road he he, he did a comparative analysis and he learned this guy's brilliant he picked stuff up like you do uh, very quickly, very intelligent guy, and but he went to all the different masters all over the world, and he found the, the top guy in India that he's working with now. So, um, yeah, he's he's no dummy. <laughs> he's a very smart guy. He wanted yeah, me to get into it. Yeah, he wanted me to go that direction, and I said, well, I mean, I don't care how powerful you are spiritually. I mean, if if the world ends and there's no planet left to reincarnate into, what's the purpose of uh, moving forward personally when we're looking at destroying the whole planet. So I'd rather focus my energy on making sure I have a nest to come back to personally and uh, leave uh, personal spiritual growth to for other lives. Uh, that was my conclusion. Well, that's, that's nice. I like that. That sounds good. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah, it, it really does. Um, so what I ended up, after I went to seminary school, after I, you know, had divorced myself from the uh, Catholic religion and cr Christian religion or, or Christian ideology or you know, all of that stuff, um, is I landed with the Vendanta Society. Are you familiar with that? Oh, yeah. I've heard of it. Yeah. Not that familiar, but I've heard of it. It's certainly a, a, a Vedic-influenced uh, Place, it, right? it, it really is and it's the only thing I mean at that time of my life I mean I've lots of other things have come in since but it was the first for me um, like comprehensive like yeah this this feels right yeah this feels right because it honors all of the you know the sages that have come before us so on and so forth but um, yeah it's a, it's like a hidden it's it's a hidden monastery i mean it really is i mean it's it's not a regularly practiced um it's not 
quote unquote a religion, you know. Um, so it's it's just it's just oh, different, it's, it's an I, actual yeah, it's it's a complete science philosophy of life. Uh, the thing about uh, Vedic um, pursuits is that the the actual act of thinking gets in the way of understanding reality. So you have to learn to uh, meditate and get beyond. Oh my God, thought. that's so true. What you said, that's so true. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that's see, that's the thing that most people don't know and understand here, and that's why it doesn't fit into Western thinking, is we think we can understand through through thought. But what the what the uh, Vedics did is they went into uh, other levels of of uh, dimensions of reality and then you can look back at this dimension and that's why they say their medicine system is the most um, uh, developed and accurate because they were looking from another dimension at the body and how it functioned and then they brought this knowledge back and they, they also read the speed of light doing this yeah. I mean they, they, they were just phenomenal brilliant it's um, true. I, I mean, they really were like the. It was like the guiding principle of like whole body, whole mind, whole spirit. Yeah, and when you're in the when you read the Vishnu Purana, you see all the different religions in this Vishnu Purana. I mean, they're all discussed because there's multiple levels of reality, and so you know different religions help you connect with the different levels. But the only one that will get you, they say, the only one that will get to the highest level, which is the, the um. Uh, Brahma is to uh, learn to, to meditate and go through the four other levels of reality, which are pure energy levels. You cannot get there any other way. Uh, and these guys actually transmutate, the ones that master it. But it takes many lifetimes to do this stuff. But before you transmutate, you actually you can live in a cave and not eat for three for 20 years, or you can go underwater for three months. I mean, this is all documented and proved. It's actually oh, incredible. I know. It's even. I mean, it's even you know, well recognized within Western, you know, North American uh, sciences. It's. I mean, it, it is. It has scientifically. Well, like I said, it's been around a lot longer than our Western medicine. Yeah. Uh, oh no. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Well, all the stuff that we're doing is. It, it's just because we've lost the connection and the understanding of this stuff. And they, they yes. too are losing it. I mean, India has been slaughtered by Western thought. Um, and uh, most of the uh, people there have no respect for these old traditions anymore. It, it's well, really sad. I, I have a lot of friends that are that are in India, and and they would beg to differ. But they're the stronghold. You know, they're the ones that that, that go that, that that were there in Egypt and for everything. But I mean, there there is a certain integrity that is historically held by most. Indian people that I know that only align themselves with their true history. Um, so there is still, I, I, I'm happy to report, a sect that is steadfast in their history and in and, and what has cultivated as a result of it. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, they're my favorite, my favorite people. Well, I'm not, yeah, I mean, there are some people who have hung in there, but um, based upon what my friend uh, has told me, it's their traditions are, are being lost, and there's very few higher level people left. Um, yes, and that's what we <clears throat> The knowledge, change. I mean, the level that he's, I mean, he's way up there. I mean, <laughs> and he says he's nowhere near the top, but he's ahead of most uh, based upon, he's got some very the top teachers. And his, his Ayurvedic practitioner, uh, teacher, is, is unbelievable, he says, what he can do. Uh, he can pretty much cure anything. Um, and it's, it, a lot of it is, is his ability to uh, manipulate energy. He sees the energy of the body. He doesn't just see a body. He sees the energy. He sees how everything's connected. And he okay, can, I want. I'll he can share influence this with you. It. Are we still online? Are, can people still? Yeah, out there we'll be on. We'll be on till about two o'clock. Uh, okay, I, I'll just say I shared this with my daughter, um, and I shared it with her before. But my son knows this too. Um, and I don't want to sound crazy because I'm afraid to be like misinterpreted or whatever. I can literally, if I put my head, if I put my face in my eyes, down close to a perimeter of something like the ground, you know, or the chair, I can literally see the movement of all energy. Um, and it's colorful and it's light and it's moving, it's moving it. It, it, I mean, sometimes it's not fast, 
sometimes it's like a slow boil. Um, it, it just, it's just always there. Um, have you heard of the I Kogi, have... uh, Kogi Indians? The who Indians? I guess not. Yeah, you should check them out. Okay, say it again. K O G I. K O G I. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm not sure why that's doing that. Okay. Yeah, check them out. Um, they're master uh, earth energy balancers. They live in. Um, <clears throat> I just heard about them actually just like a few months ago. Fascinating people. They they they're one of the three tribes on the planet that actually balance out the whole Earth's energy systems. And they they you may have some uh, of their abilities because they see energy in everything. And um, you definitely have some. Uh, uh, there's someone else I could try to connect you with. I know a woman. She's a shaman. And there's there's uh, by by invitation only, um, people who can see energy uh, can be uh, invited to uh, share. Uh, I, you know, I space can only with them. see it when I'm down close to it. So I have to be like my my eyes have to be like I said like I, if I lay if I lay my head on the ground, that's when I can see it the most, and it's colorful and beautiful and it's constantly moving. I mean, everything is constantly moving. Oh, yeah. And now, now that I, I mean, now, and I've had this since I was a kid, but I mean, I know that it's always there. It's like my friend, you know? Like, I mean, I know it's there. I acknowledge its presence, even though if I'm like talking to somebody or, or walking and if I, but, it, but I can only truly see it clearly as it, the speed that it moves. If my, my head is close to the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I swore I told my daughter. I yeah, you're you're seeing what you're me. seeing is Earth energy. Yeah, yeah. The Earth is very alive. Uh, it's very energetic. Uh, rocks are alive. Uh, my friend told me this story. She went to this um, meeting of uh, in 2000. I think it was in 2011. She was because uh, she's quite spiritually advanced within the indigenous community, and, and she lives in the U.S. So she was invited to a meeting of the, at the Hopi, uh, somewhere in the Hopi uh, uh, Reserve in Arizona. And they had the Dugon tribe, which is from Akafa, and they had the Kogi there. And uh, the Kogi brought this rock, and it said, well, the rock's telling us that it doesn't belong with us, it belongs with you guys. And they, they talked to the rock, and they yeah, no, no, yeah, this is a sacred stone that was taken from our land. So the Kogi guy put it on the ground, and he did some ceremony, and this big lightning bolt came and took the rock away. And yeah, send it I know. Back to it Africa. does that kind of shit all the time. It, it's always removing things. There's large obstacles that are constantly moving. It, it's just, it's just amazing. I, I just, I, I mean, literally, I just really don't. Yeah, know no, this is it. the world that the the Kogi and the Dugan and the the Hopi understand. But they're saying, and what they're saying is that we're screwing everything up so bad that they can't balance the energy anymore, and that they're very concerned. Uh, so yeah, it's just another warning. <laughs> to us to smarten up because the earth is alive it's it's a living well it's many beings and uh, they see all the nature spirits they see everything it's just a beautiful people and they can literally go from this dimension to another one through their ceremony they have a oh, name you, for this place you can't you can anyways i mean it's constantly moving everything's constantly moving i mean like when you dream i mean do your dreams belong to you they don't belong to me it's not anything I've ever seen in a movie. It's not anything I've like experienced. None of it belongs to me. It's it's all somewhere. Well, depending on your level of uh, spiritual development, and uh, you can go to different uh, levels, yeah, within your dreams. But generally, you stay in this realm, and you you know you interact with spirits that are just you know deceased in your dreams, and you might go to a few other levels. Um, like I don't, uh, you know, I don't. Uh, I, like I said, I have an angel guide that, that you know takes me everywhere I want to go. Uh, I'm very fortunate. But um, yeah, but these I think you uh, because you're seeing energy in the ground, you might find this Kogi these Kogi people interesting to do some yeah. research on them. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's it, I mean it, it's a little unnerving for me sometimes because um, it's a very singular experience. Like you can't share it. You know, you can't 
share it with anybody. Like nobody else sees it. It's it doesn't happen, you know. And so well, it's like a. Well, what I'm saying like, is that some people do see it. <laughs> yeah, I know, and that's good. I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're telling me. And I already looked them up, and I've already bookmarked it. So yeah, no, um, and I'll read it because I, I, it, it has felt, you know, a pretty. Um, I can hook you up with. But I'll talk to uh, a Barbara Three Crows. I I interviewed her in a another uh, uh, Indian uh, chief on my show and uh, yeah she's uh, she might be able to uh, suggest a few things too maybe she sees these things I I, I am <clears throat> yeah the thing about the the beauty of the beauty of uh, Vedic is that the, the three energies make everyone unique because we're not made of one energy we're made of three energies Vata Pitta Kapha that makes right. us all unique and then that's why everybody looks different uh, the creator obviously loved difference and uh, this is also why it's very difficult to get people to come together to, to change things because everybody sees things differently <laughs> because all our right. doshas are different so uh, yeah that's a real challenge um, but very few people understand that so but no maybe Barbara can help you Maybe Barbara can uh, uh, maybe uh, make you. D does it feel uncomfortable when you see the energy? Does it make you feel? No, it just it just it just makes me hesitate to share it. You know, because I've had it since I was a kid, and I, uh, you know, I've got, you know, issues like in my brain, and um, I've got two brain tumors, and but that was just recently diagnosed. So. Oh no! You have brain tumors. I have two. One yeah. is in an area of. I mean, they call it the brain, but I don't consider it the brain, uh, which is called the pons, P-O-N-S. And it's not an area, I, I, I've never heard of it before. It's in the so lower it's, part? It's in the lower part? Like where the no, hypothalamus? It's, it's, in the, it's in the brain stem. Yeah, so it's in, yeah. It's in the neck. Okay? Where the hypothalamus so, is and stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's in there. And, it, and, it, and it's a really important part. So it's non, uh, you can't operate on it. You know, you can't, it's just, they can't do anything about it. Mm. Um, but I've been, and you're probably not going to like the sound of this, but I've been for two years now on the list for DARPA, uh, Defense Advanced Research Agency, which is oh, yeah. part of the United States military. Yeah. Um, to, none of it's FDA approved, but the, the tumor that's in the back of my brain, um, they can operate on. And and they've I've been invited I've gone twice now to actually see what the actual surgery looks like. I mean they take your whole like they saw your whole scalp off, mm -hmm. like the bone. You know I mean the the, the scalp. I mean that's the, the bone the the cradle I guess is what they call it. Yeah. Um and they can rewire your brain. So I'm legally blind. I only have thirty percent hearing. And they could literally go in there, and in addition to taking this one tumor out that is putting pressure on my optic nerve, um, they can take that out and rewire my brain. And for good measure, I said, throw a dopamine pump in there. What the heck, right? Why not have a dopamine pump? But none of it's FDA approved. So it, I would totally be like, I wouldn't be the first guinea pig. They've been doing this for well over 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the most revolutionary um, uh, brain re rewiring uh, than anywhere else in the world. It's it's amazing. So if you're if you're blind, how can you read still? I'm legally blind. <clears throat> I'm so I I can I'm nearsighted. You know, so that means I can see things that are close. Mm-hmm. But I can't see more. I can't see past two feet in front of me. Okay. It's kind of a pain, you know. But so you can read, but you can't. Yeah, getting around it, so you have to be careful. Yeah. Well, Movement. I can't. Yeah, I mean, I I do have glasses, but I can't. Um, like I can't drive like after dusk, which you know my son's kind of stoked about because he just turned fourteen, and in California there's a special. Um, driver's permit that you can get if your parent is like legally blind so they can start so he already knows how to drive my son Ben um, so he's pretty stoked about that um, yeah I can't drive when it's after dusk and I mean I really shouldn't drive I guess oh, but, wow. uh, yeah that's yeah that's quite a challenge I'm glad you can still read though because you love to read so much 
I know. If I couldn't read, then really, literally, it would just be a... I, I really empathize with that old woman I take care of that I told you about that's 101. I mean, because yeah. that's all she did. She's an academic. She's the most well-read person I've ever known in my life. I mean, she's just amazing and brilliant, but she can't read anymore. It's it's sad. That's like her main hobby, and she can't do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. That would be very hard to lose. That, yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, well, I'll see what I can do. I'll talk to Barbara Three Crow about you, and, and maybe she'll talk to you. Uh, they're not always, they, they, they're kind of selective in who they'll, they'll talk to, so I'll, uh, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. yeah, or and I'll just, uh, I, I've already pulled up three websites, so I'll just read about them, and, and in the meantime, I'll just gain more understanding. Yeah, right. Sanjay Rath is uh, interesting because he provides a lot of uh, free videos that you can listen to his lectures, and it's a completely different world. This is the real stuff. This isn't the stuff we have here. <laughs> it's, it's quite amazing. I mean, it's really, you have to really, uh, you know, like I say, it's, it's, it's another lifetime of learning uh, the, the amount of terminology and the intricacy of it all and the complexity of it all it really is something that uh, you know it, it, it requires your full attention for a long time to figure it out yeah yeah I've got the time I mean I, I, I'm, I'm just a learner I, I just like to read yeah well you, yeah I think you absorb things pretty quickly so based upon what I've seen you write so anyways it's uh, pretty much two now so it's okay, been a fascinating yeah, okay. discussion. And, yeah, thanks uh, for uh, thanks for spending the additional time and helping me out with that. I appreciate it. I really do. Well, I mean, you're a special lady, and I'm really glad that you met no, uh, Warner too. And uh, I try to help everybody I can. You know, it's just, it's kind of who I am. And, yeah, uh, you're actually the first person um, that I've been on the radio with that's like connected. Like everybody else has been. I mean, good. I mean, they've been great. They've been wonderful. Um, but you're the first person that I, I've spoken to on a radio show that is like gets it, you know, on other levels. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Elena's good too. I, I was going to get into Vedic stuff with her, but we sort of got lost time. But yeah, Elena Freeland is pretty interesting. I don't know if you know her, but she's uh, had some uh, connection with Vedic stuff. But I just had this really uh, this friend of mine. Uh, he what he does is he looks at your picture and he, he tells your spiritual advancement uh, through the picture and he said oh you're quite advanced I'd like you to you know you should come with me in this journey and I had this two year debate with him about why I thought it was not uh, I mean it would be fun to do it but I mean I don't really uh, think it's the right time to be spiritually advancing ourselves personally because this this the planet needs us. <laughs> and, but isn't isn't that why the planet needs us? I mean why miss an opportunity it doesn't make sense well the planet needs to, uh, we have to fix the planet before we'll have any place to come back to he even said that we, we're not going to reincarnate anywhere reincarnating anywhere other than this planet he, he agreed with me on that oh my god that's terrible i hate to hear that well that's what he says now that's his view i mean yeah you know I, i'm not saying he's the gospel of everything that's true but the people that he's dealing with and he's he said we're looking at a long term uh a long term uh, difficult time here so i won't say how long it's kind of depressing to say how long it is but i don't believe it i don't believe him a long time is i mean already it's already been a long time yeah no i we're just starting <laughs> i can tell you oh, great <laughs> but I'm not telling you. I'm not saying I agree with everything. I say we had a very long chat and, and disagreement, and I, I believe my angel that no, there, there are other places to go in the universe, and I'm not even from here. Uh, I'm from another planet system. So. Well, we all we all are, we all are. I mean, I I, I truly believe that. Well, descendantly, like yeah, people... descended. We're we're yeah. Well, this place was colonized by yeah, by different human species. Well, I mean, I believe that the reason, I think I said this yesterday or last night with you, that the reason that we prayed at the heavens is because we know from where we came. It's, it, we don't, we know, you know, where we came from intuitively. It's not about God. It's about the, or, or not about the heavens, but we call it the heavens and we call it God or whatever. But we know, uh, because matter comes from the inside of stars, that we came from that out there. In the universe. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's the physical universe, though. I'm talking about other other levels, yeah. 
But no, no, yeah. There's it's a multi-leveled universe, and there's probably more than one. So yeah. And it's happening all the time. So it, it's it's it. yeah. It, I mean, the thing is, is that it's 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 within our body and our mind. It's it's a bit beyond our comprehension. I like to say, unless you do a lot of meditating and and you learn the Vedic system, which takes many lifetimes. So. I'm not worried about learning that now. I just want to save this beautiful planet because I love it. And uh, I love people, too. I think we have a lot of potential to be better. Uh, we've just got to fix our educational system, and we'll be able to fix everything on this planet. <clears throat> I firmly believe that. Kids come here a lot more advanced than, than the adults. But anyways, we should shout again sometime, Lisa. Okay, yeah, I, and, I appreciate it. Thanks for um, sharing your insights, and, and, I, and thanks for having us on the show. I know Warren's probably retired and... <laughs> Are you still there, Warren? uh, Oh, my God. I'm amazed. You're still there? Yeah, I see he's still there. But, okay, guys, great great chatting, and we'll, uh, yeah, we'll connect again. Okay, thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Thanks, Warren. Love you, Warren. Love you, girl. Okay, talk to you later. Love everyone. Night, night. Night. (laughs) Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.